Back in Acts chapter 1, if you remember that part of uh, the story of of Acts, uh, Jesus gave a, a, a promise and a command. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And over the early book of Acts, we see that gradually working itself out. Uh, So fairly quickly in Acts 2, you have the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit is poured upon the people there, and 3,000 become believers that first day of, of the church. Uh, And then gradually it moves out into Judea. Last week, we were looking at the story of Peter, who was in Lydda, and then Joppa, where he is when this chapter starts, uh, sharing with the people in Judea. And sharing, it seems, mainly with the Jews still. Uh, Samaria has been touched too. Uh, The disciple Philip, known as Philip the Evangelist, went off to Samaria, and uh, many signs and wonders were seen, and even Samaritans came into the kingdom. Uh, And there's even been a little bit of uh, to the ends of the earth. There was that encounter Philip had with the Ethiopian uh, eunuch, uh, which Kirsty looked at a few weeks ago. Uh, And then when Sabina was talking about the transformation of Saul on the road to Damascus out in Syria, so we're already beginning to see some quite dramatic things happening. But there is still this one big barrier which hasn't been fully removed, and that is to take the gospel to the Gentiles, which really, uh, the actual word means the nations. Uh, And so just for the whole thing to be released to the whole world. And and here it happens in Acts chapter 10. Uh, As we meet uh, for the first time, maybe the only time actually in the text, and and this man, Cornelius. Uh, And Cornelius is a man of status and power. He's a, a centurion in the Roman army in this Italian regiment. He had being a man who was already open to change. Uh, I've got this idea of being open-hearted, and he was open-hearted. He had been open to change. He would have begun life, no doubt, as a pagan, uh, worshiping all sorts of different gods, including Caesar himself. But he'd abandoned that uh, way of engaging with the spiritual dimension and become a God-fearer. Uh, which was a a position kind of respected by the Jews, somebody who connected with the same God but hadn't yet become a Jew themselves. And uh, that had worked out in the way he lived and acted. He was generous to the poor, and he was clearly a prayerful man. He spent a lot of time in prayer. But as yet, he was not a believer in Jesus. Maybe he'd heard some of the stories about Jesus coming from Jerusalem, but he hadn't made a commitment himself, but he was open to whatever God wanted to do now. Uh, And so as, as soon as he received the message that he did that day, he immediately sent a deputation to Joppa to uh, bring this man Peter, whom he may have heard about too. Meanwhile, over in Joppa, Peter is at the house of Simon the Tanner. Kind of speculated last week about whether Simon was a Jew or a Gentile. I think the consensus actually that Simon was probably a Jew. Uh, And therefore, it was okay for Peter to be in his home. Uh, but the sense is that Simon, the, the tanner, was somebody, a, a Jewish man who'd become a believer, who was willing to get his hands dirty uh, doing this operation of tanning, which was generally considered to be uh, beyond the pale by most Jews because it would make you ceremonially unclean. But of course, Simon the tanner lived pretty far away from the temple. He lived right in the coast, overlooking the sea, 
Uh, and so maybe being unclean most of the time because of his occupation wasn't such a big deal to him. So in a sense, there was a, a kind of, st- Peter had taken one step already by being willing to stay in the home of a Jewish man who was in all likelihood unclean in Jewish terms, but now was about to face the next step, and probably this was an even bigger step, because there was a taboo, there was an ex- a sense that Jews did not even go and visit Gentiles, let alone uh, have anything to do with them, especially leading them to faith. Uh, his experience so far, it seems, had been with Jews, it had been in Judea, uh, and in Jerusalem, but God clearly was planning something bigger at this point. And he needed people open to change. One was Cornelius, and the other was Peter. Peter was a man who was open to change. He'd been a fisherman. That had been his life, and that he'd been called to become a fisher of people. Uh, And now here we are. He's now the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and he's been called to a, a bigger step than any of these that have gone before. And that openness in both of these two men is displayed in something else. It's displayed in their prayerfulness, because both of these men pray. Cornelius, we're told, prays regularly. And it's partly that that encourages God to work in his life. That and his generous giving uh, to the poor. Uh, We had that opportunity last night with the big quiz night for Tear Fund. uh, And that's something that God likes. He likes us to give uh, to the poor. The poor in Nigeria, uh, the poor in Caesarea, where Cornelius lived. And these two things, his prayerfulness and his generosity, are what what prompts God to act to lead him to the next step in his life. And he sends this angel to meet with Cornelius and give him a message about Peter. Around about the same time, Peter is praying. He goes up on the roof to prayer. Don't encourage you to do this. Uh, It wouldn't be very comfortable in November in Scotland, and our roofs tend to be kind of at that angle, whereas the roofs in those days were were horizontal. So it was an okay thing to do if you lived on the edge of the sea in Joppa, but not if you live in Bear's Den. It isn't. Uh, And there he then fell into a trance. Uh, He was hungry. He was wanting some food. Uh, But he had this trance which challenged his Jewish sensibilities. Because this is what the message was. This huge sheet came down. And and in this sheet were all these animals and reptiles and birds. Unclean animals. And then Peter is commanded by a voice to get up, kill, kill. And eat. And he resists. He says, Well, this this is something I've never done in my life. Even though I'm just an ordinary fisherman from uh, Galilee, even then as a fisherman, I I would never eat things that were unclean. And so the next voice says this Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And just to impress it, the message upon him, this message comes three times. The vision comes three times. And then the Holy Spirit himself speaks and says, go, go. I'm going to send some men to you and go with them to Caesarea. Because I've got something big planned for you. And yet still, uh, Peter shares his reluctance. It's really only when he gets to Cornelius's house and sees what God is doing there that finally he says uh, later in the story, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts 
every, accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And in this case, this was Cornelius and indeed his whole household. Uh, what Peter realized, well, if God accepts this person, I have to accept this person too. Uh, and churches have not always been good at this. In the past, I remember hearing a story about a church, I think, down in, in London, which was on the edge of the red light district. And they developed a ministry, uh, as many churches do, to the neighboring community uh, and sought to kind of support and bring practical aid and, and care and concern to the young women that worked in that context. Uh, and gradually, they started to see some fruit with some of these girls coming along to the church and engaging with them and hearing the good news. And one by one, some of them became believers. Uh, and then the day came when a number of them were to be baptized. And they brought a lot of their friends with them. And they weren't dressed quite the way that uh, the rest of the congregation were dressed probably somewhat inappropriately dressed. Uh, and yet, a hugely exciting service to be engaged with, to have people totally unlike you being baptized as believers in Jesus Christ. But yet still, at the end of the service, uh, one of the members came up to the young minister who had been behind this new vision and outreach and said, you have wrecked this church. So it's not always easy to be in that place of accepting those that are different from us. And, and sometimes the church has failed in that area, but Peter didn't that day. So he proceeds to share with them the message of the good news of Jesus. And it's, it's a hugely thrilling message, isn't it? That Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit to heal, to deliver, to bring peace to this land that we live in. Not the overturning of the oppression of the Romans, which is what a lot of people expected, but the overturning of the devil's oppression that he had over the ordinary people. That Jesus was crucified, but three days later was raised from the dead uh, and you know, I, Peter, I'm, I'm one of the witnesses to that resurrection along with many other people. And that we as disciples have been commanded to make Jesus known as Lord, as judge of everyone, as the only source of grace and forgiveness to the whole world. And someone who even you, Cornelius, must get to know. And it's a challenge because Cornelius to us, if we, if we had a Cornelius living down the road from us, we might think he had no further need to move forward. You know, here's a good man. He's a, a believer in God. He's generous. He prays. Why does he need any more? But there was still a recognition that he hadn't quite got everything that he needed. Even Cornelius, even this good man, needed Jesus in his life. Uh, if you look on to the next chapter in uh, verse 14, when Peter comes to the point of uh, persuading or arguing his case before the Jerusalem council, he says, uh, the, this is uh, kind of, I think, quoting the angel who came to, to Cornelius, he will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. Cornelius wasn't yet saved. There was one remaining piece of the jigsaw, and that piece was Jesus. And so Peter shared the good news about Jesus. And then there's the Holy Spirit is involved in, in, the, in, the, in the whole of the chapter. The Holy Spirit is involved throughout the process, and it would not have happened without him. Uh, there's the angelic visitation. And now maybe not many of us have had angelic visitations in the middle of the night in a vision. 
But the angel uh, visits Cornelius and has a conversation with him. And as far as Cornelius is concerned, it, it is God himself, presumably the Holy Spirit, who is speaking to him. There's this heavenly vision that Peter has of the sheet coming down with all the animals and reptiles and birds. The Holy Spirit specifically speaks to Cornelius and instructs him to send a deputation to find Peter and bring him back. And the Holy Spirit is there at the encounter in Cornelius' house uh, where Peter shares the good news and the Holy Spirit comes down on the entire household of those who heard the message. So at every point, the Holy Spirit is at work. Uh, and these people, these Gentiles, speak in tongues and praise the Lord. And the Jews are astonished because they have never seen anything like this before. They would not have expected the Holy Spirit to come on these people as he had on them. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had our Alpha Saturday uh, here uh, in the church with our Alpha group. I thank you to those who are praying for that. Uh, the Saturday that you have away is, is the Holy Spirit Day. Uh, and so we had three sessions thinking about the Holy Spirit, speaking about the Holy Spirit, and then it's a time of prayer. And the Holy Spirit turned up, which was fantastic. And we're looking forward to seeing the fruit that comes from uh, the Alpha course that we've been running over these last few weeks. Because unless the Holy Spirit is involved whether it's with Cornelius in his household, whether it's with the Alpha Course, whether it's with anybody here that doesn't yet uh, know Jesus, then nothing is going to happen. The Holy Spirit uh, is the God who makes it happen. And that spirit baptism, uh, which Jesus brings, although Peter is the, the tool and instruments that he uses to bring that spirit baptism leads to water baptism. Uh, and it's interesting, it's that way round, because just a few chapters earlier in Acts 8, it was the other way round. What came first was the water baptism, uh, and then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. This time it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then they're baptized in water. Because actually it doesn't really matter how it happens. God can do it any way he wants but he sees both of these things as important. The water baptism is, in a sense, Peter's response and the church's response to say, well, we recognize your faith in Christ and we want to welcome you into the church by baptizing you in water. Uh, now, this, of course, just within a few days when he gets back to Jerusalem, is greeted with horror by the church there. Uh, this is a radical shift for them all. Uh, and I'm not going to get into that because uh, John Burns is going to share about that from Acts 11 next week, how the church got their head around this shift from the Jews, the Samaritans, and now actually the Gentiles too. It's an exciting story uh, that leads to this first group of Gentiles being welcomed into the church, and it hasn't ended since. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are amongst those who benefit from that change that happened in Acts 10, even today. So what are some of the lessons we can learn from this account? Because I think all of these elements in this story are relevant to us today in the way that we uh, undertake our mission uh, and open ourselves up to what God would want to do in 21st century Scotland. I think we need to be open-hearted like them, open to change. Uh, at the Baptist Union Assembly a couple of weeks ago, they shared three key words which are uh, the central point of the union's vision and what they're sharing with all the churches around the country. The first of these is transformation, which we see in the household there that day. 
the second is uh, generations that we should be concerned about the, the younger generations coming through. There were probably younger people in, in the household there who came to faith that day too, and we need to be concerned about the younger generations. Uh, and then innovation uh, was the third word that was shared, that we need to be on the lookout for new ways, not just um, new ways that we would like to do things or that might work for the modern culture, but the new ways that God wants to work amongst us in, in these days. Peter was open to something radically new and different, and we need to be open to however God would want us to work and see fruit in our mission today. So we need to be open-hearted and be on the lookout for open-hearted people out there in the community, people like Cornelius, uh, who is on a journey um, and is looking for the next step, maybe the final step of coming to know Jesus. And maybe we're the, the very person to tell them. We need to be prayerful. Uh, both uh, Peter, the believer, and Cornelius, the seeker, were both praying. And we need to all be praying, and we're encouraging you to pray through the small groups and the prayer course that we're doing right now. Uh, and also tonight, once again, we've got prayer space, which is looking at the prayer tools that that prayer course encourages is, you to engage in. Uh, and Alan's leading that tonight from 7 to 8. So if you want to uh, get involved in that, come here tonight at 7 o'clock for prayer space. It's something we find so difficult to do. Our lives are so busy. We just don't seem to have the time. And yet, clearly, it was a priority then. And it needs to be a priority for us today as well. Accepting. The gospel is open to everyone. There are no barriers in terms of gender or age or ethnicity or sexuality. None of these things are barriers to the gospel. The gospel is for everyone. That principle was established in Acts 10 and is true still for us today. It's not just people like us. Uh, very often it's people who are very different from us. We need to be open and accepting of anyone and everyone to receive the gospel. Sharing it. Uh, I don't think we're great at this in Scotland, probably in the UK, maybe in the Western world generally, but we're just not bold enough. We're almost embarrassed about the message. We're embarrassed that it's so specifically Jesus. Uh, we'd be much more comfortable if, yeah, being a God-fearer and somebody who prayed, if that was enough. Uh, but it's actually much more specific. You know, there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved other than Jesus. His is the name. That is the only way. And we need to become bolder. Uh, and that's something that the Holy Spirit brings to us. It was a Holy Spirit-inspired boldness that led Peter. And we need that boldness again. And so we need that filling of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to be welcomed and active and evident. Uh, because it's only through the Holy Spirit that the fruit will come. And baptizing. I love baptismal services. We don't really have enough of them here. And, and some people I know feel, well, you know, it's, it's an optional extra. Surely the connection with the Holy Spirit, the connection with Jesus is the most important thing, which you could say yes. So water baptism isn't so critical. But I think the significance of water baptism is that it is something that everyone can see. Spirit baptism, only ultimately it's the believer themselves and God that knows that's happened. Uh, if you're born again, again, it's only really God and the individual that know that's happened for certain. But water baptism, which we do in, in public, is clear and evident to everyone. We can't dispute it's have happened. We've ha we have photographs, usually. We have video these days of, of these things happening. We have memories that remember them, although they're not always that good. Uh, just one final story. There was um, 
Um, you know, we have an open membership here, so we don't require people to be baptized as believers to be members because we kind of respect other denominations who don't do it that way. But to become a deacon, you have to be baptized as a believer. And there was one occasion when we were doing a deacon's election and uh, somebody was suggested, was nominated. And um, somebody in the congregation questioned whether this person had been baptized as a believer. Uh, so there was quite a bit of scurrying around and looking in old photograph albums. And finally, somebody produced a photograph of the said baptism. And sure enough, this person was baptized. Uh, and the very amusing thing was that actually one of the people baptizing this individual was the person who had questioned whether they were baptized. <laughs> and they had done it. Uh, so the photographic evidence is quite useful. So these very same things that were necessary then for Cornelius and his whole household to come to faith are just as necessary now uh, when we are, are on mission. Uh, and, and also, I think we need to keep in mind, it, it doesn't necessarily happen here. I don't know how many people came to faith in a church or, or in a, a, another religious building, but it doesn't happen, have to happen here. Uh, my testimony is it happened in my student bedroom in Aberdeen when I was uh, at university uh, back in the 1970s. Uh, so this can happen anywhere. Here it happened in Cornelius' home. Uh, and maybe there are people in your community, maybe neighbors, uh, who are people who have connected with God, who are praying, uh, and just wondering when. You who will turn up in their house and share the good news with them that Peter did that day. Shall we pray? Uh, our, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this hugely exciting story uh, about this man Cornelius and, and his, his wife, his children, his, his servants, uh, his uh, his whole regiment, perhaps, would have been impacted by the events of, of that day. Uh, it wasn't just his family and friends, though. It was the whole church was affected and impacted. And the whole nature of the church changed that day because it suddenly was open to the entire world. There was nobody on the planet who couldn't hear and respond to the good news as the Holy Spirit moved. Uh, in their hearts. And Lord, it reminds us that you always want to do something bigger and more significant than we could ever think or imagine. You know, we look at Scotland, where perhaps not much more than a few hundred thousand people are, are believers. We don't know the exact number. It may, may be 150, 200,000 people are born again believers. And we think, how would it be possible for that number to become more significant for a, a, a larger proportion of the five million that live in this country would become uh, believers in Jesus? We think it's impossible. And, and if it was down to us, it would be. But God, you have bigger plans. You have bigger ideas. And for you, uh, for Scotland to come to faith in Christ is not impossible. So give us big hearts, Lord, open hearts. Uh, give us big visions to believe that even in our neighborhood, even in our street, there are people out there ready and prepared and desperate to hear about your son Jesus. Uh, and so give us that same big vision that you have for the communities, for the cities, for the country that we live in. And we ask that in Jesus' name.